There are three very important components to treating patients, the most fundamental ones you're hearing about this morning, surgical oncology, medical oncology, and radiation oncology. And I know that Dr. Russo is going to give you a great talk. Hold your questions to the end, and I'm sure you'll have a lot of them. Please. All right. Um, good morning. Um, thanks, Jen, for having me. So um, I'm going to step out from behind the podium because I'm short, so you all think I'm just a neck and a head. I think maybe better if I'm out here. Um, so uh, as um, Dr. Rosen said, so I'm a, a professor of uh, assistant professor of radiation oncology, and uh, we are one of the three uh, disciplines of uh, main disciplines of cancer care. <coughs> Um, this is uh, me. This is our <coughs> excuse my voice. This is our uh, website address, and this is uh, me on Twitter and me on Facebook uh, as uh, part of our departmental uh, social media efforts, which consists primarily of me. Uh, <laughs> so let's see. We are going to. I have to stay back here after all. All right, so this is a little bit of what I'll be talking about, okay? So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about, a little bit more about me in a second. I'm gonna talk about some, a principle which is called the therapeutic ratio, which is something that's really near and dear to the hearts of all, <clears throat> all oncologists, but primarily, I think, to radiation oncologists. And we're gonna talk about um, radiation therapy in general. I'll talk a little bit about the biology of radiation therapy, the physics of radiation therapy, um, how it works. And then I have a variety of case studies at the end, and depending on the amount of time that I have left, I may or may not get to all of them. I do have a timer here, so I'll do my best to stay on schedule. So um, who are radiation oncologists, or what is radiation oncology? So radiation oncology is, uh, is a discipline of oncology, and uh, we specialize in the treatment of cancers using ionizing radiation. So Dr. Blanchard just got up here and spoke to you about gemcitabine and cisplatin and Herceptin, and I'm primarily gonna talk about much more fundamental things like protons, electrons, and photons. Um, and um, that's primarily what we do. So when I write a prescription, it says electrons. Uh, it does not say the name of a drug. Um, we, as radiation oncologists, are specialty trained. Where we uh, we have uh, we go to medical school. We do a one-year internship to learn how to take care of sick people, um, and then we do uh, four years of radiation oncology residency. Um, it used to be 20 years ago that radiologists did a one-year sort of have some fun after their residency and learn how to be a radiation oncologist, but the field has become increasingly more and more and more complex. And you can't really learn it in one year, you can't really learn it in four years, so, you know, we're all still learning. Um, personally, I'm, um, and prior to going to medical school, I was an engineer. I was a chemical engineer for uh, five years before I probably got drunk one night and decided to go to medical school, I don't know. Um, here I am. Um, but. Um, that's what I did. So I uh, was drawn to this field because there are big machines and lots of computers and lots of technology. So I'm gonna talk here for a minute about something called the therapeutic ratio. So whenever we think about um, trying to treat a cancer, we think about the probability of curing the cancer versus the probability of causing a really big problem with what it is that we're trying to cure people. and. You know, anybody who talks to you about a treatment is gonna say, oh, there's always X percent chance of a side effect. And most of the time, you know, it's low, and that's why we do what we do. But, so for, for any point on this graph, there's a probability of a cure, and there's a probability of causing toxicity. So for this sort of, you know, whatever this is I made up here, there's a 70% chance of cure, but at the same time, there's a 10% chance of toxicity. So most people would say, well, maybe that's pretty good. You know, that's, that's a reasonable, uh, reasonable chance. So if you want to get a much higher chance of a cure, you know, you may get a 90% chance of a cure, but now you've got a 40, 50, 60% chance of causing some severe toxicity. And some people may not want to accept that as, as a risk for a treatment because that could be 50% chance of death from the treatment. You may have 100% chance of death if you can't cure the cancer, but you may live for six months to a year 
rather than dying during your treatment, which may not be the good thing to do. And then, of course, you know, what we would all like is a 100% chance of a cure, right? But you usually can't get there. 100% chance is kind of, you know, probability says you can't get there. And this is really an asymptotic function, so it's never really going to reach 100%. But if you have a 100% chance of a cure and a 90% chance of, you know, dying from the treatment, most people aren't going to take that. So what would we like to do? We'd like to shift that curve off that way. Because what that does then is for each one of these probabilities of cure, you have a lower chance of toxicity. So all of those chances of toxicity then come down. So how, how do we accomplish that? Well, you can modify the treatment. And in radiation oncology, typically we do this with technology. And a lot of what I'll talk about is going to be about that technology. Um, you can modify the tumor tissue. So you can give some something that's going to sensitize uh, tumor tissue to the treatment that we give with radiation therapy. And oftentimes, that's low doses of chemotherapy that Dr. Blanchard just talked about. So we give low doses of cisplatinum when we treat head and neck cancers, and that sensitizes the cancer. We know from clinical trials that the, those tumors respond better if you give chemotherapy at the same time. You can only give so much, and you can only give certain agents, but that is one way to do it. And the other thing you could do is to modify the normal tissue. So you could give radio protectors. Uh, this is like sort of the panacea of radiation therapy. Unfortunately, there aren't really any good radi radio protectors out there. There's one on the market, it's called amifostine. It's a drug developed by the military back in the 40s and 50s that was supposed to protect everyone from when there was an atomic bomb attack. And it got sort of unshelved in the 1990s and tried to use as protection against some uh, radiation that induced damage to tissue. And it, it, it's not widely used anymore because it has a lot of side effects and is not very effective. But if you could come up with a radio protector that does not protect the tumor, you'd be in good shape. So um, Dr. Rosen alluded to this. So this is sort of, I like Venn diagrams. This is a Venn diagram of cancer care. Um, so Dr. Blanchard spoke to you about medical oncology. Dr. Rosen spoke to you about sur surgical oncology, and I'm talking about radiation oncology. And most patients, you know, not everyone is here where they have all three types of physicians under cancer care, but many patients are here or here where they have uh, two. And it depends on the cancer, it depends on the stage, it depends on what the, what, what the goals of treatment are. Uh, roughly about 40% of patients are kind of in here where they see all of us. And so here's the here's how I look at sort of cancer. So this is the this is the, the dilemmas when we think about a patient. We have to think about how how can we address their cancer. So this patient has a, a localized cancer. Okay, so it, it's in one spot. It hasn't spread anywhere as far as we know. So when we think about this, we have to think about what can we do locally to to get rid of this tumor. So you can take it out. That's with surgery. You can aim a radiation beam at it and treat it, so that's radiation therapy. And chemotherapy by itself is often not used in this situation unless it's used in conjunction with radiation therapy as a radio sensitizer. So that's the local cancer problem. So next is sort of the regional cancer problem. So cancer can spread regionally. So a, lung, a tumor that starts in the lung can spread to lymph nodes in the middle of the chest, lymph nodes at the sort of root of the chest, they're called the supraclavicular lymph nodes. So this is a, this is a regional problem. So this is sort of pre-metastatic pre problem. So surgery in a lot of these cases is no longer useful by itself because, you know, cancer doesn't follow the rules and it doesn't go from here to here and leave nothing in between. So unless you're willing to take out the entire top half of the person, you're not really going to cure this with surgery by itself. So oftentimes this is a combination of radiation therapy and chemotherapy and oftentimes surgery as well problem. So these two situations here are, are curable situations. And then of course the last problem really is, is, the, is the systemic problem. And the systemic problem is you know, when the cat's out of the bag, so to speak, um, and the cancer has, has spread uh, far and wide. Dr. Blanchard talked about the problem with central nervous system metastases, so brain metastases. That's a problem that we can, we can treat with radiation therapy, we can't cure. Uh, metastases anywhere in the body, 
we can treat, we can palliate, we can be involved in this. So this is what radiation oncologists do. So now the next question is what, uh, how, how does radiation work? Um, and this is one of those things, so there are, there are people in our field who are radiobiologists. They spend their, their lives talking about this, so I'm going to do my best to give you, uh, you know, sort of the uh, 10 minute uh, crash course in radiation biology. So there are four fundamental principles to radiation biology, and when we learn them as residents, we learn them as the four R's of radiation biology. So reoxygenation, reassortment, repair, and repopulation. And so I'll go through all these in detail, but just briefly. So reoxygenation, so radiation therapy requires oxygen to work in tissues. So all the tissues have to be well oxygenated in order to get in order to cause the damage that we want to cause with radiation therapy. Reassortment. If cells cells going through the cell cycle, and I'm not sure whether anyone talked about the cell cycle yet. But as they go through the cell cycle, there are certain parts of the cell cycle where cells are much more sensitive to damage than others. So in an ideal world, like you'd like to synchronize a population of cells and have them running through the cell cycle so they all, you, you hit them with what you're going to hit them with when they're the most sensitive to that type of damage. Uh, repair, you want to minimize repair of your tumors and you want to maximize repair of your normal tissue. So that's where you'd love to have a radio sensitizer and a radio protector at the same time. So you could maximize repair with the radio protector of your, of your normal tissue and maximize damage with the radio sensitizer. And uh, repopulation. Well, you want to repopulate your normal tissue and you don't want to repopulate your tumor. That's, that's pretty easy. So if we move forward. So this is, um, you know, we all learned this in biology. General biology, right, 101, the central dogma of molecular biology is that DNA begets DNA through replication. And then through the process of transcription, DNA begets RNA. And then through the process of translation, RNA begets protein. So how does radiation therapy work? Well, where does radiation therapy work? Well, primarily it works here in replication. So the primary lesions that radiation therapy cause are DNA damage. And so what happens is you cause DNA damage, cells try to replicate, and they can't. They become functionally, or they become dysfunctional. So they cannot go through the cell cycle again, and they either go through apoptosis, or they go into a necrotic cell death or a functional cell death. A little bit of action of radiation therapy is, is at the DNA to RNA uh, step, but that's really just, again, through DNA damage. It's not directly through RNA damage. The cells can make more RNA. They only have one template of their DNA. So how does this work? So there are two primary mechanisms of uh, DNA damage. Uh, with radiation therapy. So there's an indirect mechanism and there's a direct mechanism. So the one that accounts for most of the damage that we cause with therapeutic radiation is actually the indirect mechanism. And basically what happens is uh, photons, which is a primary, or gamma rays, or x-rays, however you want to call them, which is the, the primary part that we use for most of the radiation therapy that we do, enter tissue, they cause, they interact with molecules in tissue, primarily water, they free electrons, high energy electrons, and then those electrons interact with water molecules and other oxygen bearing species to create free radicals. And then the free radicals have a short life, but they interact with DNA, and they cause lesions in the DNA. They can cause mutations, they can cause single strand breaks, they can cause double strand breaks. Enough of these mutations or enough of these lesions can be fatal to the cell. The direct mechanism is much more efficient from the standpoint of killing cells, but it's, it's not, not nearly as common, and that is when the ionizing particles directly interact with the DNA that cause a double strand break and the cell dies. That would be great, but we don't do that very often, and that's just a, a function of probability. So what happens when this happens is 
something like this. This is just one example. There are a variety of different sort of lethal types of interactions between ionizing radiation and DNA, but this is one. So you have uh, up in, in, in the blue, you have a normal looking chromosome. It has a centromere and it has a, two arms of DNA. If you have an interaction with ionizing radiation and you get single strand breaks or double strand breaks on either side of the uh, centromere, you get incorrect union, so you form a circular chromosome and then some random little parts that are floating around. This cell then goes through replication to try to make more DNA. You end up with this double circular DNA ring, which is completely useless to the cell, and then this cell just turns off, goes through apoptosis and dies. So this is one example of what can happen when DNA interacts with ionizing radiation. So I mentioned the cell cycle. So this is a picture from my notes from when I was a resident. Um, and this is the, the cell cycle. So the cells spend a certain percentage of their time in any one phase of this cell cycle, and depending on how quickly cells are, are going through the cell cycle and replicating based on what type of tissue they are and what's going on in their environment. Um, they, they can go through this cycle in a matter of hours, they can go through the cycle in a matter of years. What we know is that there are a variety of checks and balances that go on through this cell cycle. So every time cells get to a, a, a stop here, they look around, they check the environment, they say, is there enough energy to do what I need to do? Is it favorable? They look internally, they say, is everything cool in here? Do I have enough of this protein, enough of that protein, enough of this DNA? And if the answer is yes, then they go through that checkpoint in the cell cycle. Cancer cells are, you know, they're like on speed or something. So they don't stop at the checkpoints. They just go right through. So if things are messed up internally or environmentally, they, you know, this is how you accumulate mutations. And this is also how, how the cells die. Um, we know that the most sensitive parts of this, or points in the cell cycle are the end phase. That's when the cell is dividing. So it's going, it's going from one cell to two cells. So you can imagine that if you messed up that, that part of the, of the cell cycle, the cell is easily going to die. It's, it's sort of, it's, it's all out there. It's completely exposed during the end phase of the cell cycle. Whereas when it's going through replication, when it's replicating its DNA, it's extremely insensitive because all of its repair machinery is out. It's got it all out. It's copying the DNA. It's reading the DNA. So if you make a, uh, a lesion in the DNA in, in the S phase, it, it just it doesn't matter. It just fixes it and it, it goes on and it keeps going. So ideally, what we would like to do is we would like to get all the cells at M phase. So there are certain chemotherapy drugs which can cause cells to be somewhat synchronized at these certain phases. And you know, the, the, one of the holy grails of, of what we do would be something that could stop the tumor cells at M phase, and then we could give some treatment, and we would probably get a much bigger bang for our buck. So how about repair? Well, repair, like I said before, is, is extremely important. So our cells have machinery to repair single strand breaks and to repair double strand breaks and uh, to repair other types of lesions with, within the DNA. Um, tumor cells tend to be re repair incompetent. So when they fix things, they usually don't fix them correctly, but a lot of times they fix them in a way such that they can continue to go through the cell cycle and continue to, to accumulate more mutations, which ultimately can work to their advantage. Um, our normal tissues are tend to go slowly through the cell cycle and they tend to repair damage on my tumor cells. So ideally, you know, what, what we would like to have is, um, you apply your, your radiation therapy, your tumor cells start to die, you are left with an ulcer, say, if this was a skin tumor, with some intact tissue below it. And then what you want is for none of those cancer cells to repopulate, but for your ulcer to close up, and then so you've, you've got a favorable situation there. And then, of course, the last R was repopulation. So repopulation um, basically comes down to you want your, your tumor cells to not repopulate and your normal tissue to repopulate, and that would be the best case situation. 
oftentimes we, we don't win this battle. Um, we get to a point where we can only give so much treatment and we start to cause a lot of problems as we saw in the therapy ratio graph in the beginning. But at that point, we're left with some cancer cells, enough that repopulation uh, wins out over, um, over our treatment, basically. And this is sort of how it works, is we apply a little bit of radiation therapy every day. Some cells die, some cells come back. We give a little bit more the next day. Some cells die, some cells come back. We hope that by the end of this cycle that you have zero cancer cells left. But oftentimes, unfortunately, that's not the case. So if you look at radiation therapy on a, a, a sort of a continuum of dose, um, we, we measure our radiation therapy in gray. Uh, gray is uh, 100, one gray is 100 rads. You may have heard of rads or 100 centigrade. Um, so in general, we give radiation therapy, we give a small dose every day uh, for a certain amount of large dose of radiation. And you can see that we do this because we want repopulation in the normal tissue, we want reoxygenation in the tumor, uh, and we want to increase the probability that we're going to cause, you know, get the conditions right within the cell cycle that we're going to cause a damage at exactly the right time in the cell cycle for uh, to to cause cell death within the tumor. Um, so this is typically we give about two gray a day. Okay, and two gray a day roughly causes reproductive cell death. So that's apoptosis. Cells can't go through the cell cycle any longer. Higher doses, 8 to 10 gray, cause functional cell death. So this is when you start to see sort of breakdowns in the, in the, in the machinery of the cell, in the, in the pro, proteins of the cell, uh, in the membranes of the cell. Uh, in the, and then that can cause functional cell death within the tissue. So you start to cause uh, a breakdown of microvasculature. Tumors start to become uh, hypoxic and die. And then much higher doses, which we don't use very often, can cause necrosis. And necrosis is really just a nonspecific uh, burning, if you will, of the tissue. And we only do this when we know that it's only tumor. And there's nothing in the middle of that tumor that's critical. And I'll show you some examples of uh, when the goal is really to cause necrosis. So what do we use to do this? What are the tools? So uh, the primary types of radiation therapy that are used widely are external beam radiation therapy. So this is, it is what it says it is. It's given from a, an external beam. Um, you basically aim the beam at the patient, and it goes through and through, and you use a few beams that all converge upon your target, and that's how you get your, your selectivity, if you will. Although at times, it's not very selective. There's brachytherapy. So brachy is uh, Greek, and it's uh, Greek for close or near. Um, and that is when we actually put the radiation sources inside of the tissue, uh, or we put it very close to the tissue, right next to the tissue. And so these are implants. You've probably heard of prostate seed implants. I'm sure someone famous probably had one recently when we were on the news. Um, so that's brachytherapy. It's very selective because you're putting the radiation right where you want it to go, but it's not um, but if, if, if there's any risk at all that the, your tumor has spread beyond where you're putting the radiation, you're not treating it. So you have to very selectively use it. And then there are unsealed sources. Uh, these are things like I-131, Samarian-151. You can basically just give patients a drink or a pill of something radioactive. And if there's something inside their body that is going to accumulate that radioactivity, then that's a very selective treatment. So someone asked at the end of the last session, why do people with thyroid cancer do very well? Well, with thyroid cancer, you have the ultimate in targeted therapy. You have I-131. You give, uh, you give a, a little swig of uh, radioactive iodine. The, the malignant thyroid cancer cells take up I-131, and they basically kill themselves because they've taken up a, a radioactive version of what they thought was something they needed to live. So that's sort of like, you know, we'd love to have that for every tumor, but unfortunately not every cancer has something like that that we can take advantage of. So, um, like I said before, I write a prescription is for uh, electrons or photons, and if you go to Mass General, they also have protons. And I'll talk a little bit about why we use these different particles. So 
um, the electrons uh, is, are, is this graph here. So this is uh, depth in tissue and dose. So electrons treat very superficially. So if you apply electrons to tissue, the surface dose is extremely high, and then they don't penetrate very far. There's a drop off very quickly in the potency of, of electrons. Photons, on the other hand, actually are what we call relatively skin sparing. The dose is actually relatively low at the interface. The dose climbs as you get into tissue, depending on the energy of the photons. You reach a maximum dose somewhere between one and four centimeters depth in the tissue, and then it, it uh, trails off. Protons um, uh, are pretty unique in that the, the surface dose is extremely low. The dose stays low, and then there's a peak where you get all of the deposition of energy, and then they essentially stop. And this is called the Bragg peak. And so for those of you who've taken physics, you've probably heard of that. So graphically, this is what it looks like. So electrons are superficial. They stop right in a superficial tumor. So if you have a skin tumor, oftentimes it's treated with electrons because it doesn't go any farther than that. If you have a photon, a photon can treat a deep target, but as you see, the each new there went all the way off the screen, so it went through and through, it went out the other side. And then protons, go, they go deep and they stop. So this is a situation where, if let's say this was something very important, like your brain, and this was a tumor on the edge of your brain, if you had protons, you would treat with protons, because you can stop the protons right before it gets to your brain, or whatever critical thing that is. Um, protons are extremely expensive, and that's why they're not at every mom and pop radiation oncology shop. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. So how do we, uh, how do we create uh, our particles? Well, we have a, a medical linear accelerator. So this is, uh, this is a picture of one of ours down in the basement of the local building. It's room-sized. Um, it's, uh, and inside of it, it contains uh, this stuff. This is the schematic. So there's the microwave source. Uh, in there, there's an electron gun, which uh, frees electrons off of a, a metal that has uh, you know, easily, uh, that will easily shed its electrons. There's a waveguide here. The waveguide basically is the, the accelerating portion of the, of the uh, device. It, it pushes the electrons down here and accelerates them to roughly the speed of light. Um, and then there's a series of magnets and things in here that basically purify the beam. It kind of it sheds off all the low energy splay at the end of the uh, the end of the spectrum. It turns the beam around. All of this is, is is important in purifying the beam as it turns. All the low energy stuff tangentially flies off the sides. Um, and then it comes around and you bombard the electrons into a tungsten target. And then passing electrons through a high Z material creates X-rays. And that's basically how we do it. And then we can put certain things in front of the beam here to make it different shapes. And that's how we sort of uh, uh, target something that's not always round or always square. If you want to create electrons, you just take this tungsten target out of the way, and you just use electrons basically straight out of the accelerator. So a linear accelerator um, is, is actually relatively uh, small, cheap. And they're sort of, you can use them for a lot of things. They can create photons and electrons. We can treat about 95% of cancers that we treat with those two types of particles. And um, just the health economic side of things, they're likely to uh, you know, reimburse well in the future because they're widely out there and because they're relatively expensive. Protons, medical protons, are created in a cyclotron. And the cyclotron is you know, roughly the size of this room. Uh, creates, you, know, you need a big building to put it in, uh, you need a beam line that is, uh, you know, roughly about 150 feet long in order to purify the beam and to get the protons over to where you're going to deliver the radiation therapy. So you need like a half, a half a city block in order to have a proton facility. They're extremely expensive. It costs between a quarter and a half billion dollars to build a site, medical cycle. And um, the applications, the real applications are limited. I mean, every, every rich person with prostate cancer gets their prostate cancer treated with protons, but there was just a paper that came out a couple of weeks ago that shows that it's probably not the best thing for protons. As a matter of fact, the medical accelerator is probably better. Um, 
And of course, we don't know what's going to happen with reimbursement in the future. Um, when you take a super expensive treatment and you apply it to things that can be treated with something that's much cheaper, oftentimes the government is going to say, you can't do that anymore. And then you've invested a half a billion dollars in this big fancy machine that you can't use. Or at least that you don't get paid to use. So uh, that was sort of your 28-minute uh, crash course in um, sort of the fundamentals of radiation therapy. So I'm going to run through some case studies. I think I've got about 10 minutes, and I think I should be able to get through most of them. And these go from sort of the least complex to the most complex. Um, so one of the most common things that we do is we treat people with uh, brain metastases. So Dr. Blanchard talked about the problem with CNS metastases with breast cancer. Chemotherapies, Herceptin, does not, do not get into the brain. The brain is sealed off. That's a good thing most of the time. It's bad for cancer. So when we have patients with brain metastases, if this is, this is an MRI from a patient of mine, I don't remember much more of the story than that, but all of these sort of bright spots, these are all brain metastases. So this person's cancer is spreading to the brain. They have 50, 100 brain metastases. So there's only one way to treat this. When we do something, it sounds terrible, but it is what it is. We treat whole brain radiation. So we treat someone's entire brain. And this is how we do it. We take an x-ray of the side of the head. We mark out here what we don't want to treat, which is basically the face. And then that's it. That's the target. So we give a little bit of radiation every day. And this is a picture of sort of the rainbow of radiation dose. So everything in the sort of yellowish, orangish color here is treated to the same dose. And, you know, eyes, nose, face, neck is shielded. But that's full brain radiation. So that's kind of an example of the least complex thing that we do. But we do it all the time. So I saw this morning. She's probably in the part of being treated right now. So that's sort of two-dimensional radiation, if you will, because you're basically planning everything off of a, a single lateral x-ray of someone's head. So this is sort of an example of three-dimensional radiation therapy. So this is a patient with lung cancer. So this is an axial CT slice. So if you were to cut someone this way, and so you're looking down at the lung, lung, most of the lungs appear black because they're filled with air. This is a tumor here. This does not belong. Okay? These are blood vessels filled with contrast which is why they're uh, right. So what we do is we do a CAT scan of the whole patient. We don't just look at one slice. We look at all of them. Um, we draw, if you will, on a computer the tumor. Uh, then we draw all of the important normal stuff, like the lungs, the spinal cord. And that's all I have in this one. So spinal cord here, lungs here. We put some safety margin around the tumor. Tumors move when people breathe, and people don't lay down in exactly the same position every day, no matter how much you like to think that they do. So we add a little margin here for safety. And then go ahead and we lay on some radiation beams. So similar to the whole brain radiation, only this time it's a, it's a little bit more, it's like some grimacing in the front. So there's, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's a little bit more precise. You can see we, we spared this entire lung here. We spared this all half of the patient. We're using basically three radiation beams. There's one coming this way, and one coming this way, and one coming this way. And so the red is sort of high dose. So everything in here gets treated with the high dose of radiation. And it gets a little bit of radiation every day. And you know, the goal here is to kill the tumor. And we can look at how well we're doing by looking at this, which is called this volume histogram. And you can look at uh, the different structures here. So this is the tumor. This is what we want. We want 100% of the tumor to be getting a very high dose. And then these are our normal structures. So this is the spinal cord. You know, the spinal cord tolerance is somewhere around about 50-ish, 60 gray. If you get too much, you paralyze someone. So we're kind of careful about that. So we don't want the maximum to go along there. And this is the lungs. And we know that if you get too much radiation, too much volume of lung, you can cause problems. So we're, we're careful about uh, looking at the dose and volume that are against certain, certain amounts of radiation there. So that's lung cancer. So um, head and neck cancer is, a, is an interesting case study. It's a case study in sort of advancing technology. So for someone who has a cancer, say, of the throat or the mouth, uh, typically, 
they were treated like this, kind of similar to the whole brain radiation. They put on a, an X-ray beam here on one side, this one on the other side. This encompasses the whole throat, the tonsils, the base of the skull, down to the uh, sort of mid-neck, and then you would put on this radiation field here, which then treats the remainder of the neck here, which is where all the lymph nodes are in the neck. And then you would go ahead and you would treat this patient with a little bit of radiation every day. So it's kind of similar to whole brain radiation. It's two-dimensional. But what we do practically now is something called intensity modulated radiation therapy. So rather than treating just with those three beams, we treat with uh, seven beams or nine beams. And what you see here, this sort of speckled red pattern is what's called a fluence map. So we break up each beam of radiation into multiple beamlets or small beams. And you apply a certain relative intensity of radiation therapy to the darker areas and less to the lighter areas. When you sum all this together, you end up with a situation where rather than having to give the same dose of radiation across an entire single axial slice of a CT scan, you can actually have a pattern of radiation. So you can give a higher dose to the front and less to the back. I liken this to, um, I, I used to work in a dark room a lot, so this is a lot like dodging and burning, if anyone, if anyone has ever worked in a dark room. So you have a radiation beam and you're kind of putting things in the way to, to kind of block it. And when you, when you add the radiation from all the different angles, it adds up to a high dose. And roughly, it looks like this. So let me see if I can get this to work. So as you scroll through the CAT scan, um, you can see that there's a relatively low dose of radiation towards the back of all of these slices. So we're trying to shield all the muscles in the back, the spinal cord and high doses of radiation where the sort of yellow and red colors are in the front here where all of the malignant tumors are. And then we're also trying to shield the airways in the middle. You can see at some points it gets blue in the middle there. So this is a big advancement. So you can give much higher doses of radiation to the same tissue without damaging everything in between, or at least without damaging it to the same extent. That's what's important. So let's see. So that's intensity modulated radiation therapy. So then sort of the next step in technological advancement is something called stereotactic radio surgery. So the word is getting longer, so it must be more complicated. So stereotactic radiation therapy, basically what we do is we, we take a patient we, and we very precisely map out where their tumor is inside of their body, whether it be inside their brain, inside their lung, anywhere. And we have to come up with some way of localizing this based on their external anatomy or something external to the patient. So sometimes we screw frames in people's heads. Uh, sometimes we uh, have ways of uh, using just the bony anatomy on a patient. Uh, we can stick things to their heads to, to sort of come up with an external coordinate system that is a surrogate for an internal space. And so then if you can mark that, if you can track that surrogate, then you can treat much more precisely. So the first one I showed you where I showed you whole brain radiation therapy, that patient had many brain metastases. So that's, that's the appropriate treatment for that patient. Some would argue that for someone like this, who in their whole brain only has this small spot right here, this little kind of donut looking spot there on the patient's left side, you know, one would say, well, why are you going to treat their whole brain? I mean, they have one, one tumor. And so in, in 2012, oftentimes we don't treat their whole brain. We give them what's called radio surgery. So we give a very high dose right to that spot. We can use their skull as a way of, of tracking and relating the external geometry to the internal location of that tumor, and we give that 21 gray. So if you think back to that big arrow I had going upwards where I said we only give the high doses when we know it's only tumor because we're going to cause necrosis, well, this is one of those instances. It's a very small volume of tissue. We know there's nothing in the middle of there other than tumor, and so we just go ahead and give it to 21 gray, and it's, it's very effective at um, at sterilizing very small brain metastases. And it spares the rest of the brain, which probably helps to spare some neurological toxicity down the road. All right, so I am going to, well, I'll talk about this. 
All right, so this is, uh, for those of you who are engineers and physics, right, this is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So this is sort of what it's like to treat small lung cancers. So lung cancers move. So this is a patient's CAT scan. It's taken during free breathing. And so you can see the tumor here is moving up and down. It's all the time it's somewhere in that purple line, but it's not always in the same spot inside that purple line. And you can see it here moving up and down here, and here it's kind of coming in and out. So what do we do? Well, I'm going to skip over this for the sake of time. All right. And so what we do is we treat this using what's called respiratory tracking. So we have a system, we, we implant small markers inside of the tumor, and we have a system that actually watches the markers move. It relates the movement of the patient's chest while they move to the position of the tumor internally, and then we treat the tumor, and then over time, this computer system builds a predictive model that tells us where the tumor is gonna be in the future, so that we know if we turn on the beam now, that in two seconds, when the accelerator ramps up, it's going to be over there. So it ignores where it is now, and it treats over there. And if you watch, if you, if you watch this machine treat as the radiation beams turn on, the machine sways back and forth with the patient's respiration. And so this is sort of the next advancement in stereotactic radio surgery. And again, this is a situation where we give very high doses to very small areas, and we cause tumor necrosis. And 95 times out of 100, this tumor dies. That doesn't mean cure them, but that means this is what happens. So, just to, you know, so, yes. See, we, we don't only treat cancer uh, with radiation. Radiation has other applications. And I think one of the more fascinating applications is in something called trigeminal neuralgia. Trigeminal neuralgia is a facial pain syndrome. And uh, basically, it's an anatomic abnormality where there's a blood vessel that drapes over the top of what's called the trigeminal nerve, which is a nerve that comes out of your brain stem, which controls the sensation on the side of the face. And if the nerve gets too tight underneath this blood vessel that doesn't belong there, people can have what's called, what's described as this lancinating face pain. And it's so bad that the, the, the rate of suicide in patients with trigeminal neuralgia is actually very high because they try surgery, they try medication, and just nothing works, and they can't do anything. If they speak, it causes the pain. If they try to eat, it causes the pain. So one of the things that, that we can do is, since now we have this technology to target things that are very small, what we do is we can do what's called radio ablation of the trigeminal nerve. So this is the underside of someone's brain. So this is a brain stem, and this is one centimeter, just to give you a, a scale here. And this is the trigeminal nerve coming out of the side of the pons. This is the pons in the patient's brain stem. So this is pretty small. So this is maybe about two millimeters or so uh, in, in diameter. So what we can do is uh, we take this study, which is called a cisternogram. So this is a CAT scan where we inject contrast in all the negative space. So the bright stuff is the negative space. That's where the fluid belongs. And if you zoom in and zoom in even further, um, you can find in here the trigeminal nerve, which is right here. And so basically this is the fluid in between the brain and that's the trigeminal nerve. So we target this with gradient surgery and we give it 90 gray of radiation in a single sitting. So 90 gray, that, that's, that's a lot. So in order to cause necrosis in normal tissue, you have to give a large dose of radiation. So we give 90 gray to this essentially virtual target in someone's brain, and roughly 60 to 70 percent of patients get almost complete pain relief after we after we use this technique because we essentially just ablate the nerve, we just take it away, so it's no longer able to give that abnormal sensation. Of and I know I'm about two minutes over, but uh, I'm going to just uh, show you this just because I mentioned protons. There are situations where protons, I think, you know, although extremely expensive, are extremely useful. So there is a cancer in kids which is called medulloblastoma. It's a brain tumor. It occurs in the back of the brain. 
The treatment for medullary glioblastoma is to treat not only the brain but also the entire spinal cord and anywhere where there is uh, cerebrospinal fluid. The way that we do this with photons is we treat the patient from the back. This is their spinal column and their spinal cord is in this dark space here. Up here is all the stuff that uh, doesn't need to be treated, like their heart, lungs, uh, pancreas, uh, everything in their abdomen. All of this gets, you know, is, is basically just treated to scatter the radiation because photons, like you said, go in and out. As well as in the brain, you see we, this is, looks just like the whole brain radiation. We treat all the way across the back part of the brain and everything in between gets treated. If you take advantage of that Bragg peak that protons have, you can treat from the back still, you can stop the radiation being right here at the interface between the spine and the spinal column. And this is probably the, the appropriate applications of uh, protons. And this is really taking advantage of the physical properties of these elementary particles that we use to treat. And uh, last but not least, um, mentioned brachytherapy. I don't really do it for a living, but um, basically this is what it looks like to do a prostate implant. So this is an ultrasound image of someone's prostate. It's outlined in red here. This is uh, how the implant is done, so most of the men in the room will start getting a little bit squeamish. Um, so we put an ultrasound probe inside, uh, inside the rectum. Prostate is right in front of the rectum. And then right through the patient's perineum, we just put needles straight through into the prostate. We deposit these seeds, and then on an x-ray, after the fact, this is roughly what it looks like. We then can go back and uh, map out where each one of the seeds are and create a dose map of the radiation, the blue being very high dose, green being moderate dose, and the red being the dose we want to treat the entire gland with. So as you can see, if there's any cancer here, you're not getting it. So this has to be something that's done for something we know that is localized. So, in summary, radiation oncology you know, is one of the main three branches of oncology. Uh, it, it is important. We do have some curative treatments to offer. We don't only treat cancer. Uh, radiation causes cell death and tumor death through complex interaction of ionizing radiation with DNA proteins and also on tissue level as well. And um, we are heavily dependent on technological advances. All of the advances of radiation oncology are technological advances. They're not made by uh, people like me who went to medical school. They're made by engineers and physicists, uh, people who, who know how to work with, with, with big machines and, and manipulate the elementary particles of the and uh, that is all I have. All right, so we have about 10 minutes for questions. We have the microphones, the outside again. Let me grab them from outside. Do we have questions for Dr. Russo? I know we have them, but are you willing to get up and ask them? Oh, come on, you have to have some questions. Yes. Um, small, well, the smallest volume of tumor, um, let's see, what's a circle with a volume that has a diameter of about five millimeters. That's about as small as we can go. Um, and that's, what we, that's how we treat trigeminal neuralgia. So we use a beam that has a, a five millimeter diameter and we converge two or three hundred radiation beams on that one single point where we want to get 90 degrees. So that's roughly the smallest volume that we could accurately treat. No, it's typically one or the other. Um, we, so, so the question was whether or not there's an energy difference for getting the indirect versus direct action. 
Is that what you're asking about the DNA? No. So we so we treat typically our, our therapeutic range is between about um, six and uh, twenty megavolts for uh, X-rays. Uh, protons are about 135, 185 megavolts. Um, but we don't use different energies to get different interactions. I mean, it may break down to that in tissue, but it's really just a probability of, of what happens. So you're creating a lot of you know, free electrons and free radicals, and it's really just the probability that that happens in the right place at the right time, whether you get indirect action or direct action. If you treat with heavy particles, so there are places in the world where, uh, in Japan, they treat with carbon ions, uh, you can treat with neutrons, Carbon ions and neutrons are much more likely to directly interact with DNA. So they don't stop as easily. They don't interact with other particles in tissue, or with other, uh, uh, with other molecules in tissue. So they are really just bombarding the DNA directly with heavy particles. Uh, but the cyclotron to treat with carbon is yet another order of magnitude larger than the one you need to create protons. So these are things that are very experimental. And don't exist in any place. On the magnitude of the side effects, because these are tumor causing treatments. So I was wondering, of course, in particular compared to chemotherapy. Well, they're different. So radiation therapy, the side effects from radiation therapy are limited to where you're treating. So if you, you know, I'm not sure if Dr. Blanchard talked a bit any about the side effects of chemotherapy. I came in late. So um, oftentimes the side effects from chemotherapy are systemic side effects, fatigue, nausea, um, because the chemotherapy is going everywhere. If I'm treating someone with a lung tumor, oftentimes I will cause them some skin reaction, because the radiation is going in and out, I will cause them some, probably some cough. It will probably cause them what's called esophagitis or the dynophagia. So their esophagus is right in the middle part of their chest and it usually gets a full dose of radiation depending on the location of the tumor. So they may have difficulty swallowing towards the end of their treatment and they may lose some weight. We have some medications to take care of that and that often uh, recovers to normal. And I say often because sometimes if you're at the wrong point on that therapeutic ratio graph, it's called restriction, where their esophagus is permanently closed. Then you have to go and search to do something to fix that. So it does happen. It's a probability of causing a, a severe side effect. Um, for giving someone treating the lung tumor that I showed at the end with a very high dose of radiation for a localized lung tumor, these patients don't have any problems at all. And the reason that they don't is because we take advantage of technology. We spread out the low dose all over the place, so a lot of tissue gets a very low dose, which doesn't cause any noticeable side effect, and only a small amount of tissue gets a very high dose. So depending on what you're doing and what your goal is, your degree and type of side effects change. Another question. Oh, uh, here and then on the back. So I sort of two closely related questions. One is, are you operating with the practice? Are you operating at the diffraction limit when you're focusing these beams down? And then I was also curious, when you have these 200 beams, is that 200 separate emitters, or do you scan a few emitters around? So your first question, I have no idea what you mean. So, so. clear. <laughs> <laughs> so di diffraction limit is just, um, well, so I, I'm, I'm probably more of optical. Optics, I guess. But okay. is there, the first two, based on how wide of an angle your emitter is, there's a fundamental limit to the laws of optics of how small you can focus a spot. And I was just curious whether you're at those limits. Uh, no, so for a, for a regular medical accelerator, uh, we don't usually operate there. I mean, the problem with radiation, so if I tell you I'm giving you a six megavolt um, X-ray, that's really the average energy. And um, we don't want to make the apertures too small because what happens is that we, we, uh, we don't really know what the average is anymore because you're getting rid of so much of the, of the spread and the spectrum. I don't know if that answers your question, but we can make that be much smaller. Um, and when it comes to treating the trigeminal neuralgia, where we're treating with several hundred beams, it's actually one beam that's going around the room and, and delivering sort of one at a time. So it's a treatment that takes a long time. There are some machines which are called gamma knife, which is another way of giving stereotactic radio surgery, which has a 201 simultaneous beams. And so that is another way of two ways of, of accomplishing that same thing. And we have one last question in the back. 
That was very interesting, Dr. Russo, thank you. Um, I was wondering, other than for brain metastasis, what are some of the criteria that you use to decide whether in certain locations that cannot be surgically removed. And there are also some tumors in certain locations that are not favorably treated with radiation therapy. So we have dose limits to critical structures and we, we don't want to, uh, to violate those limits. Um, oftentimes, you know, once tumors become uh, regionally not localized anymore, we sort of take surgery off the table. Um, and uh, then we treat those with radiation therapy. Sometimes we can take out whatever is left after the radiation therapy if we think that's appropriate. But I would say that for the most part, it's usually anatomy and type of tumor uh, that is going to predict what, what we do as a primary treatment for a localized tumor. So I'd like to thank Dr. Russo.